Rick and Wes and Pastor Scott about a week ago, I said, because they knew what we were going to uh, start tonight, I said, you know, we may be in Romans for a couple of years because my first lesson is only six verses. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully I'll do better than that. I just get to reading and I get uh, so excited about some of the things I read that, I, oh, i got to include that, you know. So we'll try to do a better job of moving this thing along. Um, I did bring, in case some of you are interested in what I'm using for source material and references, I brought my source references. If you'd like to review those after class, feel free to do that. I, I, it gives you confidence that maybe I'm not going off on a tangent somewhere um, with some of my sources. Um, what we're going to do uh, first, and you'll see that on your worksheet, we're going to go through an introduction to Romans. We're going to talk about the city of Rome, uh, Saul from to Paul. We're going to talk about the literary form of Romans because it gives us a good context uh, for the for the letter. Um, so we'll just get started. Let's, and I'm, I hope you brought your Bibles because I'm really big on having you guys read. That way, there's a different voice in the room. Wes, I know you brought your Bible. If you'd go ahead and find for us Galatians, the first chapter, uh, verses 11 and 12. Carl, I see you had your Bible, right? If you'd go ahead and go to Romans, the first chapter, and be prepared to read verses 16 and 17 from the first chapter, okay? So, um, when we talk about Romans, uh, <coughs> Romans, in my, in my estimation, is the keystone to the entire New Testament outside of the four Gospels. If you get Romans right, then you, you more than likely get the New Testament right. You get the Gospel right. Um, Romans is the foundation of justification by faith alone. We all, we all believe that our righteousness does not come from our works, correct? We don't, we don't work to gain righteousness. Righteousness is given to us by faith through Jesus Christ. So justification by faith alone in Christ alone is our standard. So that's kind of what Paul gets into, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that's kind of what Paul gets into as we talk about Romans um, as we set our introduction today. Carl, if you go ahead and read verses 16 and 17 from that first chapter, please. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The gospel. That's, that's what Romans is. Romans is the gospel. Um, again, outside of the four, the four gospels, Romans is about the gospel. And so we want to explore that truth more, more deeply. Wes, can you read Galatians 1, 11, and 12, please? It says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, Karl Barth, one of the one of the theologians that I that I've been reading leading up to this, he says the gospel is not a truth among other truths. Let me say that one more time. The gospel is not a truth among other truths. There is only one truth. Uh, Christ. I said this on Sunday in uh, in my, our announcements and things. I said God is the epicenter of truth. He is truth. Um, truth is, is, is his character. And so any truth that comes from God, we can count on that. Uh, the silver thread that runs through Romans is the power of the gospel. That's what we're going to find out as we run through Romans. Every divine design for us by God is by and through the gospel. There is no other truth there. Um, I love this out of the Holman uh, New Testament commentary. It says this, Nothing will display the righteousness of God to a needy world like the message of the gospel. So I'm going, to, I'm going to bore home this fact before we get off of this, that the gospel is what we're going to be talking about in Romans. And how does the gospel, what is the power of the gospel, and how does the power of the gospel change a sinful human being? That, that's what we want to discover. Only the gospel can overcome sinful man, and transform him into something righteous. 
And think about that for just a moment, how, how deep in sin we are. There is no way for us to change our character. Absolutely no way. We can change habit. We can change personality trait maybe. But we can't change our inner man. And that's what the power of the gospel does. Um, the power of God for salvation occurs five times in Romans. The power of God for salvation. It's God's power that, that changes us. The basic definition of that phrase from the original language uh, means deliverance or rescue. The gospel is the, the gospel is our rescue. It is our life raft out of this world, the gospel. If we can put Romans into a single phrase, and I've already said this, but justification by faith alone. In Christ alone. There is no other way. There is no other way. Paul um, was a master of the Old Testament. Do we know that about Paul? We just came out of the missionary journeys of Paul um, that uh, Rick brought to us. Um, he was a master of the Old Testament. He, what, remember, he was a Pharisee among Pharisees, was he not? He, he studied at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel. Yeah, something. Um, and so uh, he, throughout Romans, he gives us a liberal dose of the Old Testament to declare the new covenant. He remember we don't have we don't have the New Testament in Paul's times. He's living the New Testament, right? He's writing the New Testament. So he goes back <clears throat> to the original covenant, Moses and the prophets. And he declares the gospel of Christ out of the, out of the Old Testament. Yes. Specifically, uh, Isaiah mostly, but 2 Samuel, Deuteronomy, the Psalms, he, he uh, declares the gospel from there. So we'll see that as we move forward. I'm, I'm, we're going to get to the main body here, but I really think this is important that we lay this foundation. The date and the time of uh, Paul's writing. So we know Paul is the author. There's no... There's no uh, argument with that. And scholars throughout the years have declared Paul to be the author. It was mostly, most likely written around A.D. 57 um, at the end of his third missionary journey while he was uh, in Corinth. He was headed to Jerusalem, stopped off in Corinth. Remember, he was headed to Jerusalem to deliver the gift of money, right, for the poor saints in Jerusalem. He stopped off in Corinth. This is when he wrote the letter, more than likely, to uh, the Roman church. We find that uh, some of the basis of that in 1 Corinthians. Um, it is believed, based on historical data, that Romans was written by Paul 8 to 10 years before his death, which I found interesting. So he, when he writes Romans, he's an older man. He's now been an apostle, if you will, uh, for probably two decades plus. Uh, when we when we read Romans, uh, what about the church in Rome? Uh, the local church in Rome remains a mystery as to its birth. We don't really have a record in the New Testament, nor any historical data that tells us who began the church there. Um, there's some uh, older scholars that think maybe Peter, but there's no nothing to support that. Uh, no apostle had visited there to establish the church, from what we can tell, in recorded history. Um, but Rome was the center of government and commerce for the known world at that time, uh, making it a likely spot for Christians to, to come and go, right? A Jew and Gentile alike. Um, so probably what they believe is that <clears throat> Christians who left Jerusalem, went to Rome, they settled there, they began the church there in Rome. And it was probably a fairly large church uh, from what we can tell. The church seems to have been composed partly of Jews and partly of Gentiles, which I found interesting. Because all of Paul's argument, a lot of Paul's argument in Romans is how this mystery of the gospel, right, that takes two unique groups of people and melds them into a single body of Christ. So it's, it's a perfect setting for what Paul's arguing, uh, the church in Rome. So... Um, let me see, where did I stop there? Um, so the church seems to, this is from W.H. Griffith Thomas, uh, the church seems to have been composed partly of Jews, partly of Gentiles, 
though pretty certainly with a pre Gentile predominance. So what he's saying is there was more Gentiles than Jews in the local church. Again, we're laying a foundation, so stay with me here. Um, Claudius, the ruler in Rome, expelled the Jews from Rome uh, around AD 49 50, which gives us another clue as to probably it was more Gentile than Jew, because the, the Jews were expelled uh, by Claudius. Um, Romans is written with a very unique style. Uh, you know, when, when Paul wrote a lot of his letters, they were very feeling and they were very familial, if you will. Romans is written from a totally different literary form. Um, so, you know, we know in scripture that there's poetry, there's history, there's a lot of different uh, literary forms, but Paul uses a style of question and answer. So, when I first started reading Romans, I just thought, well, who's asking the questions, right? Because there's a lot of questions that Paul asks. Well, he's using a literary form there. Um, so, he, uh, he's not answering questions that have been raised by particular members. Rather, he's trying to ask a question, give the answer, so it's a learning style for the church there. Um, by asking the question and providing the answer, Paul takes the Roman believers through a systematic survey of truth. It's systematic survey of truth, which I think is really unique. He first presents the doctrine, and then how that doctrine is practical in living and serving, and we see that towards the end of the letter of Romans. It is important that we remember that it was primarily written to a specific people for a specific purpose, by remembering this, we avoid taking the letter out of context. If we remember that he was writing to a specific group of people, a Jewish and Gentile church, trying to establish doctrine, because he had never been there before. These people had never laid eyes on, on Paul. The Roman church had never seen him. So he's on his way there. It is, it is believed by, by references in Acts that he wanted to establish the church in Rome as a base for him going into Spain. Because he makes that reference in Acts that he wanted to go to Spain to spread the gospel there, and he wanted to use the Roman church there as a base to launch him into Spain. What about Rome? What do we know about Rome? Uh, the city of Rome was founded in 753 B.C., so before Christ. Um, in Paul's day, it was the greatest city in the world with over one million in population. Think about that. That's, that's bigger than Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas put together. I, and that's larger than Johnson. Johnson County, 620,000 people. So it was bigger than our county. Um, but however, the majority of the population there were servants and slaves to the ruling class. So you have a definite two class of people uh, living in Rome. You have the ruling class, the elite, and you had those who were actually below middle class. So you have two different types of people. Uh, it was the center of politics and government. Um, Rome was very wealthy. It was known for its decadence and immorality. Um, so you have a place that the Roman church is trying to thrive in the middle of this very dark uh, world. Sounds familiar, right? Yes. Sounds familiar? Um, Rome was heavily influenced by Greek mythology and emperor worship. Uh, Rome was invested in polytheism, worshiping several gods. Uh, it's believed that Rome uh, was established by Romulus, son of the Roman god Mars. So again, mythology. And Rome reached its zenith under the emperor Augustus. It boasted at the time of Paul's writing, and we're coming to the end of our introduction, it boasted 400 temples dedicated to various pagan gods. So it wasn't like the Baptist church, the Nazarene church. <laughs> it was 400 different gods within, within the city of Rome. So uh, a great place for the gospel, right? Yeah. A great place to shine light in the darkness. But again, uh, wow, what a challenge for the church in Rome to live out the light of Christ, right? In, in that, I, I, I see a parallel to us. Uh, do you? I do, in the, in the world in which we live. Um, 
very dark, the world we're living in now. A lot of immorality, decadence, a lot of the gods that people worship, although we might see them as statues of gods, a lot of different gods that we worship. So it's a, this is a great time for the gospel to bring light into darkness. Light into darkness. Um, so let's get into... Uh, verses 1 through 6. If you got your Bibles, go ahead and go to Romans 1, and we're going to um, concentrate 1 through 6 tonight. Um, I want to read something. This is one of the books I'm using. This is a very good, if you just want personal study, the Holman uh, New Testament commentary on Romans is fantastic. It's very easy to read. It's got practical things to do at the end of each uh, section. It's, it's very good. Um, it's not like you have to use a dictionary to read it, read it um, <laughs> which some of these other books I do. I keep my phone handy so I can look up words so I have no idea what they mean. Let me read this, then we'll read the passage that we're going to get into tonight. Remember, the Romans had never met Paul personally. Undoubtedly, many or all of the Roman Christians have heard of him, but Paul's letter was a prelude to a future visit, a letter of introduction, if you will. And he wanted to make sure that the church in Rome could separate fact from fiction regarding his identity. Therefore, he clears away any confusion in the first chapter. There are three things I am committed to, Paul said in essence, my calling from God, my concern for you, and my understanding of the gospel. So we're going to talk about those three things as we get into Romans. If you will, let's start at verse 1. Romans, the first chapter, verses 1 through 6. We'll read through 6. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, through whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Now we may not, may not get to all of those verses tonight, so I apologize. Um, so if you look at the worksheet I gave you, there, there's probably some places for you to take notes as we walk through this. And, and I would encourage you, I, I, I like interaction because you guys are smarter than me. So I want to hear your thoughts and what you, would, uh, what you would say about what we're talking about today. So let's first talk about uh, Paul. He describes himself as a servant. Now, as we think about Paul, and, and I'm sure you went over a lot of this when, when Rick was teaching about the missionary journeys, um, Paul describes himself very, right off, the, right off the bat, he describes himself as a servant. Knowing what you know about Paul, what other titles could Paul have used? Well-educated, well-learned. Okay, I like that. Educated. <coughs> Carl, what'd you say? Apostle. Anybody else? Who could Persecuted. Persecutor? Persecuted. Oh, persecuted. Persecuted. Welcome to my world. Persecuted. He could have used. Um, Pharisee. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees, as when he was Saul of Tarsus, right? This man was extremely edu educated. They, they say that Romans is probably one of the best literary um, letters ever written in, in history. Ever. Because it is so concise, so pointed to the fact, um, because Paul was, they, some speculate that Paul was borderline genius, because it's so well written. And he's, he's so doctrinally aware of what's going on. So when he calls himself um, a servant, uh, so King James, King James cleans that up. It actually means, 
If you look at the original language, it's slave. That's the word he's using uh, when he writes this letter. If you go back to the original language, he calls himself a slave of Jesus Christ. And some of your um, other versions of the word use, use that term. So Paul calls himself a servant, a, a slave. So what does this mean uh, to Paul when he uses this term? It means that he's been called out. He's been separated uh, for the task ahead of him. Um, and I think it's important to know, remember we talked about uh, the two different classes of people in Rome? We said that you had your ruling class and you basically had your servants and slaves. And this is a population of over, over a million people. Who does he identify with in that population? When he, he says, I'm a slave, but a slave of Jesus Christ. I think that's important. Would well, missionary work in there too? Absolutely. When I think, you know, when you see his history and what he's done, he's very authoritative in, in his processes that he does. He's popular and uh, could very easily set himself up as somebody in that upper class instead of the, the lower class. And so, Absolutely. you know, right off the bat, he's, he's letting them know where he is coming from, the point Absolutely. of view he's coming from. I mean, he, he, was, he was part of the ruling class. Right. If you look at the Jewish structure of things, he, he was a Pharisee among Pharisees. I mean, very well-educated man. But even um, amongst Christianity, I mean, he, oh, sure. he, he held a place of authority and, and influence. Sure. And, and to identify as a servant or a slave was, as, as was notable. And what, what does that tell us about his character, yeah. right? What does it tell us? Huh? He was humble. He was humble, absolutely humble, absolutely. Um, when we look at this term slave, servant, um, whichever you choose to use, um, this is, he is a purchased possession of and by Jesus Christ, right? He sees himself as not his own. He says, I've been bought and paid for. I belong to him, right? I, I, I don't have my own agenda. I don't have my own will, if you, if you will. Uh, I belong to Jesus Christ. Uh, I love this. Uh, th I, this, again, comes from um, part, of, I'll quote part, and part of it I just uh, preface, but a purchase, uh, Paul is not expressing a base and lowly position when he said, he's not, he's not being like, I'm trying to be humble, right? That's not, that's not what he's doing. He's not expressing a base and lowly position, but rather a noble and conscious reality. This, this is not just a, a, a title. This is a reality for Paul. And that convicts me. That convicts me. Because I wonder, I wonder how often I see myself as this is my reality. Right? This is my reality. He was reality. very zealous about what he did before he became Paul. And yes. he just moved that over to his... Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, he was a man of passion, right? And, and that, that never left. Uh, he just transferred owners, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, let's see. Dr. Griffith Thomas says this. If I, I love this. It's so good. If this title, quote, if this title is not a reality to Paul, it is an utter mockery. Think about that for a moment. If this title is not a reality to Paul, it's an utter mockery for him to use this, right? Because then it's a little self-important, right? I, I'm going to call myself a slave, but I'm really important. If it's not a reality to Paul. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Disingenuous. Huh? It'd be disingenuous. Disingenuous. And That's a better word. And the talking to would know that. Absolutely. Yeah. Because when he would finally get to Rome as a, as a prisoner, because we know Paul went to Rome as a, as a prisoner uh, to Rome, uh, they would have found him out, right? So, uh, Paul also uh, calls himself, or, or describes himself as called. Uh, Paul was called. Paul was commissioned, called, sent forth by no man but by Christ. Um, who else has their Bible? 
Cindy, you got your Bible? Can you look up Acts? That's in the New Testament. Um, Acts, <laughs> right Acts, 9, <laughs> Acts 9 and 15. Do you have your Bible, sweetheart? Yeah. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 and 1. Um, Stephanie, if, if you would go to Galatians, the second chapter, just put your finger there if you would. Rick, one thing I, I think of slave is that the word that came to my mind was indentured slave. Uh -huh. And I looked it up, and when you're indentured, you owe a debt. And you are paying off that debt for a given period of time. And Paul, I, I really do believe he felt he was paying a debt <coughs> to Christ with his life through his redemption, and it would last his entire life. Absolutely. That it would just be one of those things. He was indentured to Christ. He yeah. owed him a debt, and he was going to pay it back. Man, that's beautiful. I love that. Absolutely he owed a debt to Christ. Uh, you think you think he was on uh, the road, on Damascus Road, heading to, I forgot the town he was heading to. <coughs> Damascus. Damascus. Oh, was that where Damascus was? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, and God just, you know, Jesus just knocks him down, and this whole conversion process, is, I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, Cole, Acts 9.15. 9.15, but the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Speaking of Paul, called of God. 1 Corinthians 1 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sophonus, our brother. Fantastic. Paul was commissioned, called, sent forth by no man but by Christ. Paul's missionary commission was specific and clear. Okay? Uh, we have the Great Commission go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, uh, baptizing men in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, Paul had that commission, but his focus was a little bit more narrow. He was to go to the Gentiles. He preached to the Jews. Jews were saved under his ministry, but his specific <coughs> ministry was the Gentile people, which was, again, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I think this is important. So <clears throat> if you can in your mind, put yourself in Jerusalem, right? You are a Jewish man, a Jewish woman. All you've ever known is the old covenant, the, the law of Moses and the prophets. You know by the law of Moses and the prophets that the Jewish people are a called, established nation for God, right? We know this, true? Um, all of a sudden, you have Paul, who has been killing, murdering, and imprisoning um, Christians uh, for the Jewish synagogue, right? Now he's converted. So you've got this whole entire, like, uh, all this all this knowledge in your head as a Jewish man and woman. Now you've got Paul, who is a persecutor, who's now saying, no, I'm serving Jesus Christ. I'm an indentured servant to him, and I'm coming to preach to the Gentiles. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. First, I don't trust you because you used to murder my people, and now you're saying God's changed his mind, and he's also going to include the Gentile nation? Do you, do you, do you see how um, it took a very special person to take this mystery of the gospel to the Gentile lands and, and try to merge the two nations into one body of Christ. And you had to have that strong personality. Yes, that. absolutely. It, it, it would have been me. I'd been like, oh, okay, you're right, I'm sorry. You know, um, I, I, I shrank before the task. Um, anyway, I got off on a tangent there. Um, he was to go to the Gentile people groups and tell of this Christ uh, now made available to them. Galatians 2, verses 1 and 2, and then 7 and 9. 2, 1 and 2, and then verse 7, verse 9. Uh, then after 14 years, <clears throat> I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and set before them, the privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. Seven, 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 verse seven and verse nine. Oh, okay. Uh, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, 
for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic, sorry, I read right through eight. That's okay, um, I, I wanted you to. Okay. That's fine. For, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic uh, ministry to the, to, to the circumcised worked also through me from mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to be to the circumcised. So you see, God has established a, a way for us, non-Jewish people, uh, to receive the gospel now, right? Without Paul, uh, I don't know how God would... God would have figured it out, right? He didn't need our help. He's pretty uh, smart. But yeah. He's pretty smart. <laughs> God, God's pretty smart. I don't know if you knew that or not. Um, let me see if I still want to read this or not. I, I thought this was on page 22. Um, <clears throat> oh, this is good. Okay. So after his, con uh, see, um, before his conversion, Paul was sent by Jew the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem to capture and incarcerate believers in Damascus, Acts, the 22nd chapter. As such, he was a sent one, an apostle, but by the synagogue, right? After his conversion, he was sent by Christ to do the same thing that Christ was sent to do, release the captives, set the prisoners free. By whom one is sent determines the kind of ministry you will have. That's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. True. Paul was sent to capture and enslave on the first hand. After his conversion, he was sent to set free. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Isn't that beautiful? And we, are, we have the same ministry. To set people free in yes. the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. Paul also calls himself separated this is why I have trouble getting through too many verses at one time the only the one and only purpose of, of his life Paul's life was devotion to the gospel of God and it's only by concentration of aim and effort that the purpose purpose of God concerning us will be realized quote from Dr. Griffith Thomas so he was servant called separated Several points from verse 1. We're still on verse 1. <laughs> I'm going to have to do a better job. Again, these are thoughts borrowed from Dr. Griffith, Thomas. One, Paul had a divine source. And this is on your, your worksheet. He had a divine source. Our position and authority for work in God's service come from God himself. I, I, I can't... I can't do anything in the service of the Lord unless I'm empowered and given grace to do so by God. Amen. It's God's work, Amen. right? Amen? Mm -hmm. We do not labor based on our abilities alone. If I try to, if I try to do anything in the service of the Lord based on my own ability, I, number one, I'm going to fall flat on my face. Number two, I'm more than likely going to lead people astray right? because I'm doing my own ability. As a child of God, He divinely infuses us to carry out each appointed task. How full of encouragement for, this is a quote, how full of encouragement for every true-hearted worker to remember that God never commands and commissions without providing grace to obey. But it's up to us to obey, right? He'll provide the grace to obey, to do the work that he's commissioned, but we have, we have the responsibility to obey. Amen. Number two, Paul's mission was to bring people to, to full faith in Christ, the gospel. This is our purpose in life. Our faith expressed in words and actions point to the Savior, but we have to have faithful obedience to do so. Faithful obedience. Three, Paul's motive. Paul was set apart for the gospel of God. We talked about that earlier. It's God's gospel, God's power, God's glory. It's for his name's sake. It's not my gospel. It's God's gospel. So God has to empower me to do his work. Well, doesn't that take the pressure off? Yes. Doesn't it? It just takes the pressure off. All God says, if, if you'll just be obedient, I'll do everything 
for you. <laughs> Just be obedient. Use, use, the, use the personality and the gifts that I've given you and let, and let me work through you. That takes all the pressure off. Here's the question. As I, this, was, this question was for me, but I wrote it down. I'll ask it to you. Do I still believe truly that the, the gospel will change lives? Amen. Do I truly yes. believe that? Yes. True. You know, I think sometimes I get caught up thinking, who? I don't know. I don't know if the gospel could change that person or not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, <laughs> they're pretty bad. And then I remember who I am, right? right. Yeah, absolutely. True. I love this by Oswald Chambers. Paul was not conscious of himself. He was recklessly abandoned, totally surrendered, and separated by God for one purpose, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. mm, totally abandoned. Totally abandoned. One more page. I can do it in ten minutes. I know I can. Uh, hey, can you find Galatians 3, mm -hmm. 8 and 9? Uh, Wes, Isaiah 9 and 7. Cindy, Galatians 4 and 4. When you get to Galatians, tell me 3, verses 8 and 9. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Thank you. We're on to verse 2. Aren't you excited? <laughs> Um, let's remind ourselves at this point that the scriptural point of reference for Paul was the law of Moses and the prophets. Those, of, those in what I call the Christian church who beware of anybody in the Christian church who says, um, well, the Old Testament really didn't have any reference to us today. Be, be careful of that. Be careful of that. The Old Testament is part of the gospel of God. It is. We, we, we have the red thread of, of, of salvation through the Messiah running from Genesis all the way to Revelation. So let's be careful that we don't. And don't you appreciate our pastor who preaches from the Old Testament? Yes. I do, for one. Um, not that other pastors haven't. I'm just, our current pastor does. Um, so Paul, his reference was the law of Moses and the prophets, the Old Testament. Uh, this was paramount to Paul as a Pharisee. We've talked about that, remember? Mm -hmm. He was a premier, I mean, he kept every letter of the law as a Pharisee. So he knew the Old Testament, right? Let's not, let's not forget this fact that Paul knew the Old Testament. Um, so this was paramount to Paul as he proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, so uh, it's the red cord that connects the old to the new, the redemptive work of God. That's the red cord that connects the two is the redemptive. Don't we see the redemptive work of God in the Old Testament with Israel? For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. We see God as a redemptive God uh, throughout the scriptures. Isaiah 9 and 7, Wes. It says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Will perform this. Galatians 4 and 4. For when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. We're on to verse 3. Remember verse 3, concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. This verse, verse 3 in Romans 1, is a masterpiece of inspired writing. Look how much he says in verse 3. <laughs> His son Jesus Christ, our Lord, born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. The entire redemptive history of mankind is wrapped up in verse 3. Um, so it's, it's beautiful writing. Um, Paul outlines that Christ is the Son of Man and the Son of God. Is there anything more fundamental to the Christian faith than that? We believe in fully God and fully man, do we not? Right. Yes. Remember what Paul's trying to accomplish here when he's writing this letter. He's trying to establish the gospel in the minds and in the hearts of the Roman church. Uh, verse four. And declared to be the Son of God, declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, 
by the resurrection of the dead. Jesus is the God-man without reservation because of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is no other person in this world's history or the history to come that can, that can claim divinity. Only Christ. Why? Because of the resurrection. That is our hope. That is the power of Christ in us is the hope of the resurrection. His divine birth and his glorious resurrection are the facts upon which our faith rests. This is the gospel of our Lord. Amen. Amen. This benefit requires, now here's the part that's hard for us to do, this benefit requires submission and surrender to be fully enjoyed as we see, as we see in the life of Paul. Paul fully enjoyed this truth because he was fully surrendered, right? And I think that's my problem sometimes. I don't enjoy the abundant life in Christ because I'm not completely surrendered. I don't fully submit to the, to the Lord. Verse 5, we're doing good, we're doing good. <laughs> Through whom we have received grace an apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Grace for obedience. There it is. There it is. God says, I will give you the grace you need to be obedient. We just have to overcome the human nature. If it were not for God's grace, we could not have believed. God's grace is the one that draws us. God's grace is the one that keeps us. After conversion, it is grace that enables us for service in Christian living. Again, a quote from Karl Barth. Grace is the gift of Christ who exposes the gulf which separates God from man and by exposing it, bridges it. Isn't that beautiful? God's grace exposes the great gulf that rests between us and God, but it's His grace that also builds the bridge. Where we can get to him. Amen? Yes. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Isn't that beautiful? Final thoughts. Let me hear what you have to say. It seems like an odd thing. I was looking at that word separated, and I was thinking of what, what other things are separated. And you look at, um, it's, it's something that helps you identify the differences in things. You know, if you have, you know, milk and cream, and it, it, they're together, you really don't, they, they look like one item. But once they're separated, they have completely different properties and, and, and functions. And, and, functions. Mm -hmm. and, and by doing that, it, you know, if you look at just humanity as a, as a whole, it, we all have the same basic, you know, the, statistically everybody's the same, you know, mm -hmm. more or less. And, uh, but when you're separated, uh, th then you should look different, you should perform different, and you have a different function. Yeah, and I think that's a, you know, obviously it's a, it's a holy separation is yeah. the intention there, but that right. uh, it shouldn't, you shouldn't look and act like everybody else or have the same yeah. function yeah. as everybody else. We are a holy people separated by God. That separated, I always think about uh, sanctification. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that dedication and uh -huh. that obedience and things like that. Paul was separated, you know, to the gospel of Christ. Yes. And that, yes. that whole thing, you know, yeah, I, I don't don't understand why, but I always look at that as sanctification. Yeah. We're saved. Uh-huh. Are we sanctified? Uh-huh. We can be. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Sanctification. If we believe, if we believe, so... If, if, if obedience is a one-time thing, right, then, oh, I've, I've obeyed today, I will have to obey tomorrow, <laughs> right? No? It doesn't work that way? <laughs> Sanctification is the same way. God, I, I, I'm obedient today. God is moving me along the path of sanctification, being set apart as I'm obedient to him, right? So it's, it's a, where I die, what do you say? I die daily. Right? Mm -hmm. So I have to be obedient on a daily basis. Very good. Thank Amen. you, brother. Amen. Anybody else? Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, Lord, we thank, thank you, Lord, you for today this for this word. I, I, boy, I see Lord, help us to, 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 God, to uh, understand in me, what you have Lord, for us. Uh, the significance of the word we heard today. There is such an important, I just thank you, Lord, uh, for the Apostle Paul, who is completely obedient to, know to your the word will of God us, and to, to know our how Savior, to pattern Jesus our lives I pray, Lord, based on your mercy and the same grace for us, type of but also obedience in me. And I just pray, Lord, that. You would help me, God, Lord, in, in, to, to be that separated in, one, uh, to God, be obedient on a daily basis in all things. Give us strength for, for Lord, today. indeed we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our daily and I thank you, Lord, Jesus. today. It's Lord, I pray your blessing upon this group today. I pray, Lord, Lord, that you would please you, uh, walk with yes, them the rest of this Lord week. Jesus, God, Give them Lord. strength and favor and grace. Thank you, Use us, Lord, as your people. And we thank you.